the best of Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell, a composite show from August 7th of 1998 and September 11th, 1997 on Area 51, including one of the most interesting calls to ever occur on the show. So sit back and enjoy the best of Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. From the high desert and the great American Southwest, I bid you all good evening, good morning perhaps, dependent on your time zone, and there are so many from the Tahitian and Hawaiian Islands out west, eastward to the Caribbean and the U.S. Virgin Islands, south into South America, north all the way to the pole, and worldwide on the internet, thanks to broadcast.com, this is Coast to Coast AM, and I'm Art Bell, and tonight, as promised, as waited for by many, we are going to discuss... Area 51, and we're going to talk to government employees who wish to spill their guts. <laughs> Should be an interesting night. Now, it has been quite some time since I have done this. In my last foray into government agents in Area 51, the satellite which transmits my voice to you supposedly lost Earth lock which is an interesting way of suggesting that the satellite suddenly moved and no longer knew where Earth was, right in the middle of a critical call. Now, coincidence? Synchronicity? Perhaps? I've got a little bit of a lead for you. Most of you know Matt Drudge, who writes for the Internet and probably annoys most of the mainstream media. I'm going to read you something that is just about to break this weekend. Now, a lot of people thought that Area 51 might have moved away, oh, perhaps to Utah or some other location. Wrong. Secret military bases, 1,850 people now employed at Area 51. Underground installations, ultra-secure manufacturing plants, secret labs that America needs to wage the Cold War are still intact despite federal downsizing policies that have gutted many other military and civilian programs, but, oh, not Area 51, folks. The Scripps Howard News Service, according to Drudge, is set to move a pair of features on its circuits this weekend. It will say that more than 1,850 federal civilian workers are currently employed at Area 51 in the southern Nevada desert, just over the hill from me, most in well-compensated jobs at several ultra-high security facilities in and near the range. This really is one of the last big secret military bases in the U.S. It used to be that the Air Force tried to pretend that Area 51 did not exist. Actually, they still do. So who works there? Non-government military observers believe that hundreds or perhaps thousands of military and civilian workers are employed in the desert facilities taking daily flights from Las Vegas airfields into the base. Computer records appear to confirm this. Now, whatever is done at Area 51, officially designated the quote, Nellis Air Force bombing and gunnery range, end quote, on Nevada maps, is certainly still done in secret. But Scripps suggests that the base is the testing grounds for America's most secret military machines, everything from our favorite 117 stealth fighter to, get this, folks, electromagnetic pulse weapons. Now, do you remember the fellow who called my show? who was actually shot down over Area 51? Now, that might resonate. Uh, he claimed in the last frantic moments that it was an electromagnetic pulse weapon that did his aircraft in. Remember? The Wire also explores the super-secret Cheyenne Air Force and Army Complex. In the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, there are 6,000... 658 employees there. Now, how in the world can Matt Drudge or Scripps or anybody else know the exact number of employees in Cheyenne Mountain? What do they do? 
Cheyenne Mountain operates military communications and navigation satellites. Ostensibly, it watches for the launch of any high-altitude missile system anywhere in the world. The center also tracks more than 8,500 objects in Earth orbit to warn man space flights of uh, possible collisions and assists the Justice Department and U.S. Customs hmm, in illegal drug interdiction programs trying to track aircraft suspected of carrying dope. Isn't that interesting? So, uh, tonight, what we are going to do is to cast away all the normal news, and we are going to open these lines this night for Area 51 employees. Many of them, by the way, live very close to me. Many live in Pahrump. Many live in Las Vegas. Many of you, I'm sure, well, no doubt have things that you would like to get off your chest. Things that you have seen and done at Area 51. Many of you who have penetrated or tried to penetrate Area 51 and seen things. And then another category as well, government employees. People who work for the government at various secret installations around the country and know things that you would like to get off your chest. So that is going to be the business of the night. Area 51 employees and government employees who wish to sing. All of that coming directly ahead. We'll be right back. Stay tuned for the original broadcast from September 11th, 1997, when the GE2 satellite inexplicably lost contact with the Earth, right here on the best of Coast to Coast AM. I'm going to repeat this one more time because people are not listening tonight. For uh, Until I say otherwise, all of my lines are devoted to those of you who are either current government employees and wish to sing about whatever, uh, any, any song you would wish to sing, those of you who have been or are currently employed by Area 51, that non-existent base over the hill from me, all of my lines are devoted to that. So everybody else, sit back and listen, and let those who uh, do fit into one of those categories get through on any of the lines. Let us begin. On the first time caller line, you are on the air. Good morning. Hey, how are you doing today, Art? I'm all right. Where are you? I'm in Colorado. Colorado. Oh, Colorado. And uh, I do, I'm just a recent listener to your show. Okay. I started about three weeks ago. Really enjoy the stuff you talk about. Thank you. And what I did, I was an airborne ranger in the Army for 18 years. And one of our assignments at times were to try to penetrate the security around some of these secret bases. Like Area 51? Yes, exactly like Area 51. In other words, you, you would be given the assignment of trying, kind of like a computer hacker tries to get into the Pentagon by their permission you, with their permission, would try to break in and, and breach their security. Yes, this is right. Cool. How did you do? Oh, well, we did a, had about a 40% success rate the first time. You've got to be kidding. Uh, no, it That's was... That's horrible. You mean to say... It uh, was free sloppy, but... So, in other words, an enemy agent, if that's what you were, mm -hmm. would have at least a 40% chance... Of, of breaking in. <laughs> okay, now you got to remember, this was like 15 years ago. Yes. Okay, the last time we tried, which was like five years ago. Yes. Uh, we were successful about 9% of the time. They stepped up their security immensely. Uh, they have ground sensors, and they, you talk about your night vision scopes. Well, they got some that will probably put this one to shame. Oh, I know. And uh, they really stepped it up. Now... For a base that's not there... Area 51? Right. Uh, not there. not supposed to be there. 
They got some amazing security measures there. <laughs> I know. They have ground sensors. They have, as you point out, night vision. They have helicopters with infrared uh, and heat sensing. That's right. And yeah. and I'm you know there are people that you know they they try and they've made it in a few of them, and a lot of them of course sit in jails. Yeah, because it's a federal offense. That's right. Uh, now there's two ways of looking at Area 51. One is that our country has a right to a really, really secret place where we develop things like the F-117, that kind of thing. That's right. F-117, the B-1B, the yeah. B-1C. Sure. But, I mean, all of that is now like the Model T compared to what we've got. Exactly. And, uh, and, and then there's one other little factor, and this is where a lot of people begin to say, I want to know more, and that is they think there's been extraterrestrial contact they think that technology has been transferred to the U.S. government mm -hmm. uh, because of some kind of deal with them, and that yeah. that technology is being tested at Area 51, and there is some evidence to indicate that might be so. There's a lot of... Call toll-free 1-800-618... No, no, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it, hold it. You cannot say that word on the air. Okay, I'll say oh, that is weird. that is that is one of the seven deadly words the FCC doesn't like. So you saw some weird fertilizer. You saw some weird poop. Yeah, okay. you, saw, you know, just modify but it a little. It, be all right. Just as soon as uh, you ask what it might be, mm -hmm. I mean, you're immediately taken off of any assignment you might be on. Well, what ship to some place like Anchorage, Alaska? <laughs> Um, Anchorage isn't that bad. Now, um, uh, Thule was not uh, one of the favorite uh, tourist sites. Uh, but look, let me ask you what you saw. What did you see? Can you tell us? Well, you, you hear people talking about particle beam and electromagnetic beam. That's right. And lasers. And they say the only way you can run a powerful enough laser to take down an aircraft or maybe a missile, it would have to be, you know, huge blocks. You know, blocks long. And some of the things I've seen... Mm, no, no. Now, I can't, I can't say exactly, <laughs> okay, because then I'd be in breach of a government contract. But take it from me, <laughs> they're getting this technology from someplace. All right. Even though you can't give us precise details, yes. you saw particle beam weapons, that sort right. of thing. At least that's what I thought they was. I mean... You take something 100 yards down the range and you point a box at it and hit a button and it explodes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and just where do you think this technology came from? Well, I'm with you now. I believe that there are a lot of UFOs, ETs, whatever you want to call them, okay? I mean, I've seen some weird stuff in my life. Not, not now, you're, you're not necessarily with me because I didn't say that's where I was. I said that's what a lot of people believe. Well... That is an I important believe. distinction. Okay. And, and I think it's indeed possible. Now, as you may have heard, I had my own sighting of a triangular craft that came 150 feet over my head. Just on a night like this, when the moon was just about full, blotted out the moon, stars, uh, this was a craft that defied gravity mm -hmm. uh, without question. And so either we have many generations of aircraft uh, development that we don't know nothing about. That's a big story if we have anti-gravity. Uh, anti-gravity, yeah. Or it was one of theirs. You know, I'm betting that it's one of theirs because I've seen a ship something like you was talking about. I drive a truck at night, which is how I ended up listening to you. All right, and that's also like how you, you saw it. You know, because most people, do you know most people never look up well, when you drive at night, you tend to look at the stars quite a bit. That's right. And I was watching this light. I just figured it wasn't, you know, a regular airplane, right? Mm-hmm. Now, unless we have figured out a way to uh, make the G-forces negligible or the laws of physics not apply, it was going in a straight line and immediately, I mean immediately, did a 90-degree turn and was going in 90 degrees. You know what that would do to a human being? Yeah. I Be jellyfied. That's it. All right. Uh, thank you very much, my friend. Take care. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hey. Hey. 
I tell you, you... You're going to have to speak up uh, a little louder. Okay, how's, how's this here, sir? Uh, much better, thank you. Where where are you? I'm not going to give my location. All right. But I will give you a number. So, uh, a, a number? Mm-hmm. You mean we, we would know you by a number? Uh, you, you don't mean your phone number? No. Okay, give me a number. We'll call you by number. 27. 27. Number 20. I beg your pardon? 27. 82 D4. 80, 2782 D4? Yes, sir. That's, that's a long name. 2782 mm. D4. All right, 2782 D4. What, what, uh, what's your story? I am 13 years old. 13 years old? Mm hmm. You're telling me the government employs people 13 years old? Mm hmm, because we're the new, we're the new people. The new people? And they teach us early. Basically, to go out and kill and destroy. The government is teaching 13-year-olds to kill and destroy? You betcha. Well, now that I ponder recent headlines, that might make some perverted sense. Yeah. Funny. I just took out a missile silo. You took out a missile silo? Pretty ambitious for a 13-year-old. Oh, I know. It's fun, too. <laughs> and the well, guy you just had on talking about the red guns? Yeah. He's on the money. He is on the money, huh? So you got the real thing. Particle beam weapons in the hands of 13-year-olds? You betcha. And let me tell you something. They're fun. <laughs> They're fun. And I think that's where, um, uh, that's where our 13-year-old decided to bail out. Well, so much for 2782-D4. <laughs> there is a big full moon out there tonight, so look out. I have no idea what's ahead. Government employees, Area 51 employees, who would like to get whatever it is that may be on your chest off. That's what we're going to be doing tonight on all of the lines. So if you have a song you want to sing, a story you want to tell, you pick the line. And here we are. We'll be right back. This is Coast to Coast AM. Maybe it's this way. Here's an interesting fax, but uh, you're going to have to act now, not later. The fax reads, Art, I witnessed and observed alien-type bodies in underground facilities in the Dayton, Ohio area. Now, I can't and won't give my name. There are still live beings kept there. From my understanding, they were recovered in the last two years. Now, I am willing to discuss more with you at a later date. I will contact you. Well, this the time is now. The date is today, and you should fax me again with a number, and I'd be glad to give you a call. Now, and, and by the way, that goes for everybody else. Anybody else who cannot get through on the phones, I realize they are jammed to the gills, who has a really interesting story to tell, uh, be assured that if you want to fax me and uh, give me a number, I will, well, I don't know what I'll do. I'll destroy the fax after I have talked to you so your number can get to nobody's hands. How's that? I absolutely promise your anonymity. So here we go. Wild card line, you're on the air. Good morning. Uh, hello. Hello there. Where? Uh, well, you might not want to say where you are. Probably not. And do you want to say what part of the country you're in, just generally? Um, well, not really. Are you in the country? Yes. All right. I am a time traveler as well. You're, you're a time traveler as well? Yes, I am. From when? From when? Well, uh, not too far from your future. Only about four months. Four months in our future? Yes. Why would you be here four months from our future. I'm worried about that. Well, uh, I'm what the government called a wrangler. A, a wrangler? Yes. What does that mean? Well, uh, it's, uh... In the Old West, I think it meant that you wrangled cows, but I... Well, it's, uh, sort of like that. It, uh, there's a... Are we, are we the cows? Well, no. Good. Another animal is, though. And, well, uh, a liquid is extracted from these animals for a propellant. For a propellant? Yes. 
precious bodily fluids extracted yeah, for propellant. It's going to open up many, many doors. This is the except, thing except that the perhaps, United States except, is looking for, for. Except perhaps for the extractee. It's going to close some doors for the extractee, isn't it? Yes. And that would be the weasels and the beavers. Hmm. And uh, Do you realize how ecologically, politically incorrect that is? Do you realize how much trouble you could be in with, well, our, I don't know, the EPA or somebody? Look at the government. Do you think they're going to care about weasels or beavers? Well, uh, what about our president? Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, a time traveler from four months in the future. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hello there. How are you? I'm just fine. You're going to have to yell at us. You're not very loud. Okay. Um, just a... Area 51 line, right? Well, they all are tonight. Area 51 or government employees, one of the two. Yes, um, I've penetrated Area 51. Oh, come on. No, um, it's kind of a stupid story, actually. Um, me and some of my friends were having, like, a keg party up on Freedom Ridge. Now, Freedom Ridge is an area that overlooks Area 51. Yes. So you were having a keg party. Which yes. means you had a bunch of beer up there, the, right? A whole lot of beer. A whole lot of beer. Yes. Uh, so you were totally scorched uh, on Freedom Ridge above Area 51. Yes. Now, right away, you know this is a bad mix. <laughs> right? Not at the time I didn't, but I do now. Mm-hmm. And so what precisely occurred? Um, well, a bunch of my friends were, like, passed out, and I still wait, so I decided to take a walk. And I kind of, in a sense, crossed over into Area 51. You cr kind of crossed over into Area 51? Yeah, I kind of stumbled over the border. You stumbled into Area 51? Yes. You staggered into Area 51? Yes, you can say that. Uh-huh, I, I just did. And they, no doubt, uh, came and collected your butt. Yes. And then what? Then they took me to the base. To the base. Yes. Now, you see, normally, most people arrested at the perimeter or inside Area 51 are turned over to the local sheriff there and thrown in the county pokey. But you were taken to inside the area itself. Yes, I was. Did you happen to see anything unusual while you were there? No, um, they had a hood over my head. A um, hood? Yes. So I couldn't see anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, were you allowed one phone call? Um, no. No um, phone calls. They told me I had no right, that I was um, on protected ground, and my rights did not matter to them. So the Constitution ends where the Area 51 gate begins? Yes. Well, in your condition, you probably couldn't argue very hard, so what did they do with you? Um, well, I remember driving through the desert because it was bumping and stuff. It would be bumpy. Yes, and then we hit a paved road, and it was real smooth. Then I remember them dragging me out and taking me down several flights of stairs. Yes. And I was taken into a room, no windows, nothing. This is a single desk and two chairs. And there was two guards at the door, two at the back of the room, yes. and two behind me. Right. And there was... A man, I don't know if he was, like, in charge of everything there, but he was asking me questions, why I was there, who I worked for, and all this. Who you worked for? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did I, you tell him, look, we just were having a kegger up here? Um, I guess he got the general picture when I, like, breathed on him. I bet he could get drunk off my breath. <laughs> <laughs> Threw chunks all over his floor? No. To prove it? No? Um... They kept me there for about three days. Three days? Yes. They took me down to the sick bay. Uh, well, all right, that follows. But, I mean, surely you were cured of whatever illed you uh, in at least 24 hours. Why didn't they release you? And what happened during the next two days? Um, they interrogated me some more. Uh-huh. Now, that's, that's amazing. And then finally, what did they do? Put you in a vehicle and drive you out to the perimeter and say, get out of here? Yes. 
And uh-huh. they, once I did that, they told me never to say anything about this again. <laughs> And uh, and so, of course, now calling a national talk show, you're keeping that promise. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, um, uh, by the way, were there any threats? In other words, if you talked about this whole thing, did they threaten you? Um, no, they said, um, you better not talk about this, because um, this is a big desert. <laughs> I know it is a big desert. All right, thank you very much. Uh, there you have it. Uh, that's what can happen. There's a little example for you. If you do happen to stumble in any condition into Area 51, people will call me frequently asking about Area 51 and whether they should uh, try and breach security up there and go see what they can see, and I tell them no. You know, you will definitely get arrested or worse. And I would imagine under severe circumstances, they probably have the old James Bond license to kill. West of the Rockies, you are on the air. Good morning. Hello, Art. Hello there. Um, this is a good topic you got on here tonight. Well, it's different. Can it you different. Can you add to it? Oh, pretty good. I'm in Seattle. Yes. And uh, I've been in and out of Edwards and Palmdale since 1967. Mm-hmm. Uh, with many of the companies that work in those locations. Oh, there's a lot that goes on at Edwards. Oh, yeah. And Palmdale. Uh, well, in 1989 and 90, I worked on that airplane that came out of Palmdale, which they only built 22 of. Really? Yeah. What kind of airplane, sir? Uh, the one that, that radar can't see and it's supposed to be invisible. Well, that would... You mean the stealth? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um... Are you familiar with composite structures? How I certainly do, am. Composite how materials. Together? Yeah, yeah, composite well, materials that don't reflect radar signals, or if they do, they reflect them uh, away from the uh, away point from of point of origin. Mm-hmm. Correct. Sure, I know something well, about that. On the B two, when they put the wings to the fuselage, they have these gaps between the uh, composite, the regular airspace, which they have to fill to get the radar signature out. Right. In case it's uh, infiltrated. Well, they were making these titanium shims to put in there, and uh, we thought that the shims were just regular, normal-grade titanium. And um, after we did some of our own little testing on the bits and pieces that uh, you know were laying around, yes, we found out that it was an a aluminum titanium composite. Really? Right? Yeah. Which really, to this day, I don't think even exists. Aluminum titanium. Aluminum titanium composite. That's that's those two metals. But mm-hmm. here was the clicker. The binding agent was a silk fabric, which you couldn't cut with with a razor knife. It would actually dull a razor knife. You couldn't drill a hole in it. You saw all this with your very two eyes, right? Yeah, I had the clearance. So I mean, I, I was eligible to see it. See it how it. how are you able to now safely talk about it without fear of, you know, men in black or? Whatever. I'll take my chances, but I'm 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 pretty certain that your phone is secure tonight, and they it is. It's and secure. they can't do any tracing. And I'm pretty sure over the years my phone's been been uh, bugged because of all the projects that I worked on that within the black world. Why have you decided to talk about this? I mean, particularly about specific composites. Well, you're, well, you're saying things I've never heard before. Well, you're you're talking about Area 51, and everybody sure. knows what goes on over there. And in my world, Area 51 doesn't exist or never existed. <laughs> and um, In my world, it's just over the mountain to the... Yeah, uh, I know exactly uh, where you are, and I know <laughs> in relationship to Area 51 is. Yes. In your world, it exists. In my world, I don't know what you're talking about. I see. But this composite material came from Area 51. They were the only people who could work it. They were the only ones who could build it. And it was kept under armed guard when it traveled between the two places. I know an attorney... Uh, this is uh, something that eventually is going to be public if it is not already, and it is to some degree, who is representing a number of workers at Area 51 who worked with very exotic materials and claim they got sick. Now, the government is trying very hard not to allow this lawsuit to proceed because it would open up a can of alien worms, or worse, uh, at Area 51. Are you aware of that? Well, I've heard of it. NPR ran a series on that not too long ago. Mm-hmm. Are you uh, at all concerned that you might have been exposed to something that might make you sick? Well, over the years, uh, over the years, I probably have. 
exposed some exotic stuff, but it's nothing. I'm still alive today, and I'm not sick, so I'm not going to worry about it. One leg has not become shorter than the other. Or no. something. If you keep your mouth shut, you do. You play by their rules. You get to fly some of the strangest airplanes in the world. Work on them. Look at them. Did you Same get? Did, did, well, no, no, wait a minute. Did you ever get to actually fly? Well, I'm a licensed pilot, yeah. and uh, we've talked before on that topic. Um, yes, there are some airplanes that have been flown that uh, radar can't even see. And you have flown in them? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're aware of that stuff. What was there. it? Of course I am. What was we, it? Well, I'll tell you, uh, give you an example. It what? happened in the summer of, of the summer of 90. Okay. 1990. Uh, we were taken off from Palmdale. Okay? Yes. We had... Uh, Two F-15s on our wingtips, and the tower cleared the two F-15s to take off. They couldn't see us. And uh, when we were airborne, we were joined by something else and something else. And uh, something else and something else. And something else. <laughs> Undescribed. Undescribed. And right. we headed out over the Pacific. Okay? Okay. And we got 200 miles off. Russian aircraft met us because they knew we were coming. Russian aircraft? Russian aircraft knew where we were coming. Okay? Now, that and implies... Wait a minute. That's 1990. That that implies cooperation between the U.S. and the um, and, and, and Russia. The Soviet. No, there was no cooperation. They were just they were just dogging us to see what we were flying. Ah. They, they knew the two F-18s and these two other aircraft and the 14s had left. And they... Um, they just met up because they knew what the procedures were. What's it like riding in an aircraft like that? It's, I've flown so many arts, it's just like riding in another airplane. <laughs> and uh, there's just some weird stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe one of these days, maybe it'll all come to light. Perhaps so. One of these days, maybe it will. All right, thanks a million. No problem, Mark. You, you take care. Uh, that was as much as I could drag out of him. There is an interesting phenomenon that occurs here where I am in the desert. Now, to get my signal from here to there to you, I have what's called a KU band uplink. And we fire a very, uh, or a relatively narrow signal from my home to uh, GE-1, General Electric Satellite, that sits up there in geosynchronous orbit, 22,300 miles above Earth. And so, obviously, we have a signal going from here to there. We transmit a signal from my home. And we also have an, uh, an awful lot of overflights here of helicopters of the black variety, of fighter aircraft that will scream over the house occasionally at a low altitude, and I have been told by more than one person that my KU band transmitter turns on their threat receivers. Now, obviously, we're over uh, friendly territory here, but turning on threat receivers of uh, F-15s and so forth has always worried me a little bit because of some sort of automatic response some sort of harm missile coming down my throat. I've always worried about that just a little. On the first time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, I'm on the air. You are on the air. Is this flying coming from your end to my end? I beg your pardon? Do you hear a high pitched whine on your end? I do hear a high pitched whine, yes. Uh, I think I'm being traced up front, okay? Look, um, you, you, you've, you've, got to, you, you've got to always assume it's possible. What? that it's possible that you're being traced. I'm not transmitting anything on this end. Well, I'm certainly not on this end, so... Uh, anyway, say what you want to say quick, so you can't get... All right, real quick before they shut me up, okay? The uh, Greys, best theory is they originated here on Earth around the end of the Jurassic period. It was a very advanced civilization of uh, humans, uh, close enough to humans to breed, but the uh, offspring is usually sterile. And they was uh, particularly made to go out to planets, explore, and then come back because nobody wanted to uh, take a thousand, two hundred thousand year trip. And at the end of Jurassic period, they um, started getting a little bit overpopulated. Yes. And uh, started making some genetically engineering plants, specifically uh, peanuts and other lettuce began like that. And uh, it spread further, and they started taking nitrogen out of the air, decreasing the, air, the atmospheric pressure. Yes which uh, a lot 
start things called the um, uh, dinosaurs start dying off. And that uh, did another thing with corn. So you're saying that you're saying they, the greys, actually killed the dinosaurs? Uh, yes, because they're reducing the atmospheric pressure. Well, I guess that would do it, wouldn't it? Yes, uh, a lot of the dinosaurs, if you look at the uh, dinosaurs... Well, uh, listen, why are you worried they're tracing your call anyway? Yep, you yep. say? I said, why are you worried they're tracing your call? Well, I got the whine right here on my line. I know, but I mean, why are you worried? Well? You haven't said anything yet that they would care about. We'll be right back. This frequently, but let me read you yet another fax I have, and I will try making a call, all right? Art, I worked at Area 51 for 15 years and would like to talk to you about what really went on there. I worked in base ops. I'm also involved in the class action suit against the government. I can be reached tonight at the fine gives me a number, which, by the way, is a Nevada number, a work number. Uh, please, he says, don't give out my number, which, which I certainly will not do, but I am now going to try to place a call to this gentleman, and we'll see if there's anything to it. There's nothing like radio on the fly, huh? Now, let's see if we can get him. Hold on here. We'll try. Anything's worth a shot here. This may go, may go nowhere at all, but his name is Fred, or he calls himself Fred. We'll see if he's really at the number he suggests he's at. ABC? Hello there. Yeah? Hello, ABC. Uh, Fred? Yep. This is Art Bell. How you doing, sir? Well, I'm doing just fine. Um, I got a fax from you that says you worked at Area 51 for 15 years? That's correct. So, uh, what, uh, what can I help you out with, sir? I've, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to, to, uh, Sort of uh, contradict. Uh, All right. Let, let me start out by asking you yeah. uh, on your facts, and when you just now answered the phone, you said ABC. Yeah, that's. Yeah, please, uh, we, we need to not discuss anything further about trying to identify me by where I was. All right. All right. Yeah, this is another place I'm at now, so so. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Let's discuss your 15 years at Area 51. Mm hmm. Can I have no idea what you can and can't tell us, so I'll probe and you tell me when you can't answer. Sure. What kind of work did you do? Um, I was involved in the uh, uh, the general day-to-day -day operations uh, through the base ops, uh, uh, scheduling, uh, uh, things of that nature. Really? Yeah. Uh, qualifying for using the, the airspace of the box, uh, the... Uh, of course, the uh, Nellis Air Force Base, uh, if something people don't really notice about that was we actually controlled the airspace on the, on the whole range. Oh, I'm well aware of that. And, uh, how, and, how, and much, how much when, airspace actually is controlled above Area 51? You know, that's, that's difficult to say, but, you know, the box we're talking about was 10 by 10, 10 miles by 10 miles. Anybody familiar with uh, aeronautic charts knows that is forbidden airspace. Yes, so that's a fact. Yeah, anyway, uh, when we uh, uh, took the... You have to understand, we controlled the box. We allowed Nellis to use, use the, the range. When we were in the box, Nellis was off the range. When we were off the box, then Nellis could use the range for their red flag, things of that nature. Okay. And, during, uh, the, during the years that you were at Area 51... Mm -hmm. Did you see anything that you had no rational explanation for or that uh, did not make sense in terms of um, a, a technology that we would have developed? Well, you know, um, I haven't been involved in some of the development of some of the projects that came out of there, so I'm at liberty to discuss those. But nonetheless, we, uh, um, there is a big lag time uh, before something goes white world and when it's in development and there's a big lag time in between the things that are you know, spec'd out or scaled out 
and developed between the time that they even go from being scaled to, to full production and then of course when they go from black to gray or, or black to white world there's a lot of time involved there so I speculate that anything that, that I saw uh, during the 80s uh, of course had some time on it uh, as far as development was, was concerned okay so, well we know for example the F-117 stealth was developed there and came out and then went gray and then went white and we all know about the F-117 saw it fly in Iraq and all the rest of it yeah but that was a long time ago oh yeah now what would you imagine maybe we can talk about this hypothetically uh, what would you imagine would be several generations down line from the F-117 well you know they there was different prototypes involved and everything uh, out there but uh None of them as uh, mysterious as the uh, things that are discussed on your program. Uh, I'm, I'm here to say that uh, it wasn't a building, a facility that uh, was there that wasn't out of my control and that uh, there was nothing mysterious about what went on there. Then why are there things that you cannot talk about? Oh, because they're, they're, they're classified uh, military hardware and, uh, and they can't be discussed. That's just, is that simple? It's, uh, it's just like before the 117 went uh, white. Uh, it was not allowed to be discussed. It, there's nothing uh, extraterrestrial, anything about the development of that airplane. I understand. Yeah. Are there areas of uh, within Area 51 that are underground? No, absolutely not. There's there was one facility, a small bunker out there, about as big as a, a basketball court, if that, and it was only underground to protect the. Instrumentation from uh, RF interference. Are there three large hangars at Area 51? Uh, there are. Uh, there's one huge hangar. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, a couple other small ones there, uh, smaller than that. But uh, generally speaking, the the hangars are nothing bigger than what you could put a average jet fighter in uh, mm -hmm. or uh, something of that size. All know. right. You're in Las Vegas, just mm -hmm. over the hill from me. You know exactly where I am sure. in Pahrump, right? Oh, exactly. Well, as we look over the hills toward Area 51 on many, many nights, we see, and there are it's well documented by Japanese camera crews, American camera crews, amateurs, exactly. uh, things that rise vertically and do dances in uh, the sky that just simply are not done by any conventional aircraft we know about. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I'm here to tell you one thing. Uh, I've never in my life seen uh, a vehicle which I considered uh, um, otherworldly or anything like that until I did work up there. Uh, but uh, during that particular time, uh, um, there were four of us that were standing outside, and we actually saw the five aircraft that look like, or not aircraft, but say uh, things like a star, okay, in the sky. Like a star. Like a star, but it, it was at, uh, at sundown. And I figured, well, maybe this might be a, a, a satellite, for instance. But there were five of them, and they were uh, sort of, uh, three of them were abreast, two of them were tra trailing. And they went from horizon to, say, mid-horizon, or mid-vertical you know, vertical sky, yes. in about, well, maybe... 15 to 20 seconds, <laughs> and then we were looking at it and saying, boy, this is really something we've never seen anything quite like five satellites grouped like this, and then the two that were trailing did a 90 degree and went to the east. Uh-huh, satellites don't do that. And then the other three went uh, directly over the southern horizon, and we all looked at each other, so we happened to have uh, radio contact with the operations white room up there, and we uh, co contacted them and asked them to check the scope, see if anything was up, and uh, there was nothing on the scope, so uh, we looked at each other and said, well, that's kind of amazing. But anyway, what happened was about um, 30 seconds later, the three that went all over the south horizon came directly back and went to the north horizon, uh, and uh, they did that in about, like I say, 30 seconds, horizon to horizon. And absolutely no sound. Uh, you know, uh, of course, the satellites don't do that either. So that no, was, they do not. That was a very unusual thing I saw out of my entire 15 years of being there. And uh, the rest of the stuff, I would have to say, was just uh, high classified military projects that, uh, you know, needed to be discussed in this forum. But there were absolutely no um, 
you know, otherworldly. Uh, Were you required uh, when you left your employment there to sign? Uh, oh yes. A debriefing statement. A debriefing statement. Mm -hmm. And were you to violate that? Uh, what, would I or, or have no, I? No, no, no. I said, uh, were you to violate it, um, to finish the sentence, uh, what would be the repercussions? Uh, I think it was a 10 year, 10,000, something like that, was, was the, the bottom line on it. Yeah. Uh, 10, year, 10 years in jail, $10,000 fine max for divulging, things like that. But uh, anyway, um uh, uh, Things are happening right now, and, and I've uh, got to go back and do some work here for these people. All right, just one last yeah, quick thing. You said you're involved in a suit against the government right now, and in fact there is a group uh, suing the government, claiming they were injured um, working with uh, materials or by you know, the government burning materials at Area 51, yes. exotic materials. Yes, and that, that's in fact uh, part of our thing. We, you know, we just uh, filed uh, recently to go into the uh, Supreme Court. And we got our, our date, uh, well, we filed our paperwork, we're waiting for a date now to go to the Supreme Court. What do you think your chances are? I don't know. It's always difficult to, to say, you know, what might happen in a situation like that. But uh, from all uh, the aspects of what I've learned, uh, um, we might stand a good chance if we get into that venue. Well, as you know, for years and years, the government, and as far as I still know, uh, as far as I know now, it is still true. The government says there is no such area as Area 51. Yeah, that's that's a big chuckle, though, isn't it, Art? <laughs> if you ever been, I guess, out to the place they used to call Freedom Ridge, uh, which became popular, you know, uh, right at the end of there, uh, it was, uh, you know, everyone knows it there, you know. Yeah, it's, it's in documents. It's on... Uh, on TV, things like that. Fred, thank you. All right. See you later, Art. Uh, stay out of trouble. What? West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. Hello. Turn off thy radio, please. It's on its way down. Good. Where are you? I'm in Alaska. Alaska? Where? Um, well, I'm in Palmer now. Palmer. All right. Well, you know, I was just in Anchorage. Yeah, I know you were. Um, are, were you born before 1953? I was born in I was born June seventeenth, nineteen forty five, on Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. Okay. The reason I ask is I grew up in Colorado. My father worked for a packaging corporation that took recycled paper and made boxes. Way back then? Way back then. I didn't know we recycled that long. We we recycled years and years ago. People don't realize that we recycled. Okay. Anyway, do you know what int is? That would be E N T. Yes. No. Int is a military base in buried in the mountains in Colorado, and it's a nuclear safe. You know, one of those dug way deep in the ground. Yes. In I'm not sure. Probably a hardened site. Yes. In 1960, early 60s, maybe 61, 62, mm -hmm. I was a young boy, 9, 10 years old, mm -hmm. and my dad came home from work with uh, a book on flying saucers. Yes. Ant had brought a bunch of paper to be destroyed. Uh because they didn't want it out in the public's hands. And your dad brought it home? And my dad brought one home. I was supposed to do that, you know. And I thumbed through this thing for months, fascinated at the hundreds and hundreds of uh, official spaceship or reports. Yes, yes, so what have you done with all of this documentation? Um, you know, I don't know what happened to the book. Um, I'm sure that my brother looked through it. I don't know what my dad did with the book. And uh, and your show has just brought this book back to Boy, me. I sure would like to lay my hands on it. Um, I'm telling you, it would be an amazing piece of paper. And I don't know that, you know, if anybody else has... Is uh, your dad still alive? My dad is still alive. Why don't you go to him... And ask him. You're doggone right. Yeah. And if he still has that book, uh, you and I need to talk. Privately, mm -hmm. you think you could arrange that? I will. I will call him and and ask him if. All right. If you could lay your hands on it, mm -hmm. you either fax me or write me, 
or email me or get to me somehow privately, and we'll set something up, all right? Okay. All right. Thank you, my friend. You, you take care. Ooh, would I like to lay my hands on that? Wouldn't that be neat? We're going to take a break here at the bottom of the hour. Once again, come back and do I Have No Idea What. Now, don't touch that dial. The devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a three. And by the way, I don't know about the earlier ones. They were pretty good. But this last guy, I'll bet you, I'll bet you he was a real thing. That's just my own call. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hello. Hello. Yeah, our bill. That's me. Yeah, uh, I'm the archaeologist who slipped in Area 51 last year. You're the archaeologist who's... Yes, uh, I don't know, maybe I don't quite meet the criteria. I'm not a... Oh, you know, yes, you do. If you slipped into Area 51, you definitely meet the criteria. Well, I hiked in there for 100 miles. I was in there over a week. Um was so far into Area 51, I could actually see out the other side. In fact, contemplated doing so south to north and I will say this uh, it, it was the uh, <laughs> mind boggling thing I ever did in my entire why, life why, uh, look look why first of all did you decide as an archaeologist what was of interest in area 50 at area 51 I was following the Death Valley 49ers a uh, wagon train that got lost uh, back in 1849 and no kidding yeah, they they left. Uh, they took a shortcut, ill fated shortcut, as it turned out, uh, from the Utah Nevada border. And and uh, as fate would have it, of course, uh, <laughs> they went directly right through the center. Of what, uh, of course, you know, legions of UFO people <laughs> believe is Area 51. And um, so you were simply following their trail, and the trail led through Area 51. That's correct. And I pleaded with the Air Force uh, for. Oh, several years uh, to allow my team access uh, to several archaeological sites. Uh, one, of course, is uh, Papoose Lake. Uh, that's Papoose Lake, yes. Critical uh, uh, archaeologically because that was the last campground uh, of the 49ers where their cohesion failed there, and uh, uh, they went different directions in a you know an attempt to escape the the desert. And uh, uh, there are seven known. Um, rock inscriptions from that wagon train. One of them, and uh, out of the seven, for instance, uh, six or or all five are well documented. The six I discovered myself uh, near the Utah-Nevada border, the seventh lies deep in what's called Nye Canyon, which is just above Papoose Lake. Mm -hmm. There's a, an old photograph of it that I carried in there, uh, taken in the 30s, before they closed the area off, of course. Okay, so obviously um, you were refused permission Yes. A number of times, and then at some point you decided to hell with them, you're going in anyway? I cast reason aside, and I admit it. And, <laughs> uh, but I'm not sorry I did it. Uh, I, I'm sorry I didn't find the inscription. I did find evidence of the wagon train, however, and I did get within a mile of the lake bed at Papoose Lake. Uh, oh, my. Now, there's no known photograph, of course, of Papoose Lake, except from taken from some... Mont Sterling, I believe, 50-some miles away. Yes. There's computer-generated photographs, now, of course. Now, did you have a camera with you? Yes, I did. And, uh, and I've you... got uh, magnificent color photographs of this place. And uh, I, I don't believe, you know, I've been accused uh, by people that uh, have done a disservice to my country that I've... Uh, what have you done? What, security. What, what have you done with these photographs? Sir? I've done nothing with them. Uh, I intend, and I, I have a book proposal with the, oh, the Jeff Herman Agency in New York. Uh, the book will be called Forbidden Journey, and I, I hope to include those photographs, but I will not do so, you know, until I am assured that uh, they will not. And I don't believe they will uh, show anything uh, uh, that would, uh, you know, compromise national security. Now, well, look... Without describing specifically what's in the photographs. It's a magnificent, clear photograph of Papoose Lake taken in the daytime. Uh, now, in, in the, and in the daytime, it, and I had a powerful set of binoculars. Yes. It looked like a dry lake bed to me, nothing else. Well, that's what but it at is. at night, it uh, was a different story. What did you see? I could time? clearly see what were security lights uh, on the perimeters, and, and I could see what appeared to be... Uh, lights that opened and closed near the center of the lake. Uh, 
Oh my! What was that? What I don't know. As far, but I during the daytime now I got like I said within a mile of of the of the lake bed, and I I was getting a little bit concerned there because uh, I, I wasn't so concerned about ground security, but uh, airborne would have found me in a heartbeat because of Absolutely. vegetation. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I, I was having my, my lunch, and this is the farthest north I, I, I intended to go. I wanted to backtrack in the Nye Canyon. I, uh, I was having my lunch in a little, well, a, a wadi, a little tiny wash, really, mm -hmm. uh, apples and peanuts, and I, uh, I, I felt vibration. And I, I, could, I know I wasn't imagining it because there were rivulets of sand coming down just on the other side of this little wash, and I could see them. Oh, down. you didn't imagine it. And I thought, uh, well, hey, uh, <laughs> an earthquake. Well, then I realized, no, this is not an earthquake. It continued and continued for maybe nearly two minutes. Mm. It, it's something they're testing, either directly underground, or I was feeling vibrations completely from Groom Lake. I don't know. But, uh, I mean, it, it was just a mind-boggling... Uh, did you see any, uh, particularly at night, did you see any lights rising above the desert floor no i saw nothing hovering uh, i didn't see anything that i i would uh, justifiably say that uh, uh, i could explain as as unexplainable yeah, as let me tell you a, a very interesting story and see if this resonates good word with you i have a very good friend who lives on the other side of the valley much mm -hmm. closer to area 51 in fact You're rachel yeah, that's right. In fact, he works there, and I will not identify him behind that. This friend of mine built a porch. He's got a mobile home on the other side of the valley. He built a porch, and he sunk um, two befores or better into the ground, you know, to support the porch, right? Mm -hmm. And he began to hear, hear these and feel these strange vibrations at night, mm -hmm. so strong, so strong, uh, that, believe me, it killed him to do it. He ended up tearing the porch down to stop the vibrations because he couldn't sleep at night. No kidding. Yeah, so there's something going on out there underground. There's no question about that. Now, so you spent exactly how much time in Area 50? I was in there a week. Oh, boy, talk about forbidden archaeology. Oh, I, I mean, I, I'll tell you right now, Art. I mean, I have good backcountry skills, but I was very, very lucky. I... Anyone who's contemplating storming the ramparts of Area 51, think again. Yep. These guys are in there with weapons of war, and they will, and they can, they kill, they, they can kill you. And, and I, I felt just something about the way I saw many guards, and I saw them, most of them, fortunately, from a distance, although not always. Um, something about the way they carried themselves. I, I think if they'd have caught me in there, they'd lit me up like a Roman candle. I understand. Now. I want to try something out on you. You have these remarkably clear photographs. Yes. I understand you're going to write a book, publish a book. And most people who write books and publish books want publicity to sell their books, yes? Sure. So would it not be advantageous to you to take one of the more intriguing photographs and send it to somebody like me? Uh, who would then interview you when your book comes out? Well, you're, uh, you certainly reach a large market. I, 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 congratulations I do. on your Newsweek article. I, it's, it's, <laughs> you're up so late, I, I never catch you. <laughs> and I, but I, I read, read Newsweek, and I saw your article in there, and okay. uh, you well, reached 10 you, million people. That's yes. an interesting point. It is, yes, uh, it is. And so I'm, I'm, I'm making you an offer. I'm... I'm I'm trying to make you a deal here. I'm trying to get a photograph is what I'm trying to do. But, uh, but were you to send me one, why, I could post that on the website. Then when the appropriate moment came, I could do an interview with you. And who knows how many books you'd sell. Probably many. Well, uh, really, I mean, but I, uh, my picture is, of, uh, is a clear photograph of Papoose Lake. I mean, how... Uh, it's a dry lake bed. I mean, it looks pretty much like the computerized photograph. I'm not... Uh, I know, but there are not existing... Clear, as you pointed out, there are not existing clear photographs. That's right. <laughs> well, my idea was, well, I'll print the book, and, I, uh, and then and the photographs will be in the book, and they'll just... You know, that'll sell the book, but you got a, you got a good point there. I know I do. 
<laughs> Why do you think I made the offer? <laughs> well, uh, let me seriously consider that. All right, so that you've got my address. You seriously consider it, and I'll, I'll look for it, all what right? What is your address? Just, uh, oh, you want my address? Mm -hmm. It's Art Bell, P.O. Mm -hmm. Box 4755 mm -hmm. in Pahrump. That's P-A-H. Yeah, no, I'll spell it. R-U-M-P. Okay, good. Nevada, zip code 89041. Okay. Dash 4755. Now, listen, my mail comes in by the bin. I get bins of mail. Okay. So take a magic marker and write on the outside of whatever you send me, forbidden archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I ought to just send you the book proposal. It's called Forbidden Journey. That'd be about it. <laughs> forbidden archaeology. Yeah, okay. that's right. That'll, that'll be my key. That'll well, be our and, and, and I want you to know that my... Uh, hey, uh, uh, my interest, of course, is archaeological. Uh, I would love to see these 49ers brought to the fore as they should be. They're as, a, as relevant a group as, as the Donner Party. No, I understand. And, and I understand why uh, you were there. Really, if the Air Force would allow me, uh, you know, I, I pleaded with them. I had uh, a congressman intercede on my behalf. It, the answer was not no, Art. It was no, 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 uh, you know, I, I pleaded with him. I had uh, a congressman intercede on my behalf. It, the answer was not no, Art. It was no, 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 hell no. <laughs> I, and I mean, I, I offered them, you know, they could blindfold me, uh, uh, escort me. Uh, I, I wasn't asking for that much, and it just kind of burned me. I mean, it, this was sort of like my land, just like it's your land. Well, uh, right now it's their land, so it was not only no, but hell no. <laughs> no, yes, yeah, and that's the, the exact conversation, too. I appreciate the call, sir. You bet. Take care. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Well, a pleasant good morning to you. Where Oklahoma. are you? Oklahoma. Oklahoma, huh? Yes, sir. All right. Um, that's something for your consideration. Okay. In the past, you have uh, shared with us listeners, and you and I discussed this one night over the air, uh, if some really big catastrophe should happen, say, coming in from outer space. Yes. That you'd do as Paul Harvey and make a traveling mic and go out and... I absolutely would. As a matter of fact, I should tell you that I now have the microphone to do that. I've got a permanent outside microphone that I'm about to mount. It was sent to me by some very nice listener, a very professional outfit. But yes, in other words, if an asteroid was coming in or something, sure, what the hell? I'd go outside, take the microphone, and talk that sucker in. Why not? Well, here's something for you to consider. Mm -hmm. Next Wednesday night, Thursday morning, the moon is going to occult Saturn. Which means? Which means it's going to pass in front of Saturn. Okay. So so far, that's not catastrophic. No. No, no, no. I, I hope. Say a tune-up. Check your system out. It is quite an impressive Oh, you, you suggest that I would go out. Oh, how impressive. Those Saturn, I mean, you've got to have a good telescope to see that. No, no, no. You can see it through binoculars. Right. Uh, it doesn't. Now, when, when the moon occults a star, the star, like, winks out. I mean, it just... Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that's dramatic enough to justify going outside and, you know. Well, take a look at it anyway. It's might be good practice. Bike. Now, if we, had, if we had a big rock, say, about six miles wide, bearing down on us, uh -huh. now you're talking good reason for a remote end of the world broadcast. Well... Yeah, but you can use this as a tune-up. As a tune-up. All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll mull that over in my mind. Thank you. On my Area 51 line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Yes. Hi. Um, I, 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 I don't have a whole lot of uh, time. Um, well, look, let's begin yeah. by finding out whether you're using this line properly or not. Uh, area 51. Yeah, um, that's right. Were you an employee or are you now? Uh, I, a former employee. Former um, employee. I, I, I was let go on a medical discharge about a week ago, and and <laughs> I, I've kind of been running a, across the country. Um, oh man, I don't know where to start. They're they're uh, they're, they're gonna. Um, they'll triangulate on this position really, really soon. So um, you can't spend a lot of time on the phone. So give us t something quick. Okay. Um, um, okay. What well, what we're thinking of as as aliens are they're uh, they're they're extra dimensional beings that an earlier precursor of the um, 
a space program made contact with. Uh, they, they are not what they claim to be. Uh, they have infiltrated a lot of uh, uh, a lot of aspects of, of, of the military establishment, particularly the Area 51. Uh, the, the disasters that are coming, they, the, the military, I'm sorry, the, the government knows about them. And there's a lot of safe areas in this world that they could begin moving the population to now are but, but they're not the, doing they're not doing anything they are not they want the major population centers wiped out so that the the few that are left will be more easily controllable discharge <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, I started getting... Broadcast from September 11, 1997, when the GE2 satellite lost what is known as Earth Track or Earth Lock for unexplained reasons. A backup connection was established and the show continued. You're listening to the best of Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Well, this was certainly interesting. We are now on a backup system, everybody. Uh, backup system. And uh, you, that one caller that I had on the air, <laughs> I guess we were about in the middle of his transmission, his telephone call, which was a, one of the strangest ones I've ever had. And the entire transmitting system by satellite went down here, and we were notified we were off the air. And it would appear to be from this end and some sort of uh, massive transmit failure. So we are now using a backup system to be on the air. And not that I would normally believe this kind of thing, mind you, but I can't help but wonder if somebody, somebody zapped us in some way. Uh, we'll find out. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Our bell? Yes. Uh, what just happened there with the transmission? Oh, well, what happened is the transmitter uh, here blew its cookies. Uh, in some way, something knocked us off the air, and we're on a backup system now. It's uh, the government, or I don't know. It has to be something, though. Well, did you hear? Now you tell me because you were listening. That was awful strange. There was a really weird guy on the air when it went off. Yeah, real weird out. Like uh, going, sort of, sort of sounding paranoid, schizophrenic, yeah. like crying and everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and how far into the conversation was it when when it went off? Just a couple, about fifteen twenty seconds, I'd say. Oh, you like you, you guys missed you, you really missed a call then, and I've got a feeling somebody didn't want you to hear it. Yeah, because <laughs> um, it was really strange. All of a sudden, I'm hearing Mark Furman, and when I went That's out, right. Well, the network up. the network, of course, went immediately to a backup tape while we tried to figure out what blew up here. Uh huh. So that's what you heard happen. Uh huh. And then we're now on a backup link system uh -huh. uh, to be on the air at all right now. So, well, I'm telling you. Am I on the air right now? You're on the air right now. Well, you all better right. be, yes. <laughs> and uh, Where are you, by the way? I'm in Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, I called the other night. And uh, I wanted to ask two things. Real quick. Well, I wanted to say one thing, and I wanted to ask another. Real quick. I wanted to ask if you could play the um, remote viewing uh, one when you were in... While you go to Egypt? Yes. And also, I wanted to know uh, uh, all the, this uh, stuff about, like, uh, Area 51, if it's, like, the government's trying to put it out there like that, so, like, some other place isn't being watched as much. In other words, it's a big decoy. I see what you're saying. All right, thank you very much. Apparently, we are back on the air, and apparently, we'll be back after the news, I think. <laughs>
this hour on the best of Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell, Art speaks with former and current employees of the supposedly non-existent Area 51. And now, back to the best of Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Let me tell you what a very, very interesting uh, turn of events. Right in the middle of a very, very strange, one of the strangest calls I've ever had. We apparently lost all transmit capability on this end. Here in Nevada, the transmitter went belly up suddenly for some unknown reason. I've never seen it do this in all the years, all the years that we've been on the air. I have never seen the transmitter in this way just simply fail, a massively fail, like a massive heart attack of some kind. And so we have gone to a backup system to get the signal to you right now, and I presume it is getting to you right now. Totally bizarre, folks. Totally bizarre. So I presume that you got to hear uh, whatever they grabbed quickly, which I believe in this case was a bit of the Mark Furman interview. Must have seemed a bit out of context, I would say. Good interview, but you had to hear it in context. All right, well, we will continue on with the backup system and go to work on the primary system. This is why we have backup systems. I'll tell you, live radio is weird stuff, folks. Anything can happen, and this is uh, another perfect example of that. On the run, trying to get things done in a five-hour program, anything can occur, and we have had... My, my transmitter has had a, an apparent massive heart attack. <laughs> or something happened to it, or something uh, somebody did something to it. And I will not mention the alternative means we're doing to get... Uh, uh, accomplishing to get a signal up there right now, or to the network, let me put it that way, but uh, pretty weird, and it certainly occurred at a pretty weird time. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Art Bell? Yes. Turn, turn your radio down, please. Turn it off. There you go. Thank you. Where are you? This is Barbara in Kingman, Arizona. Hi, Barbara. I, my husband and I have a question about that... Uh, interruption you had and also uh, about uh, Dannon. Yes. And 